Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Coming up on Off 90, from the sheep to the spinning wheel, meet Nancy Ellison of Zumbroda, who crafts traditional Scandinavian fiber art with the help of a few fluffy friends. See the city of Rochester change and remain the same through a collection of beautiful vintage postcards. And watch as a group of elementary school students from Cannon Falls makes mosaics inspired by Afghanistan. It's all just ahead, off 90. Hi, I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Off 90. The tradition of weaving, spinning, and felting wool has been around for thousands of years. But since the Industrial Revolution, the art of doing it by hand has drastically declined. Thankfully, there are many dedicated to keeping the art alive. Nancy Ellison is one of them. She owns a small sheep farm in Zumbroda and keeps close to her Scandinavian roots. Her sheep supply her with wool, which she then spins, weaves, knits, and felts into both traditional and modern creations. When you climb in and weave on an old loom, you just sort of wish it could talk and tell its history, and you just feel like you're a part of the past. Spinning and weaving is uh, mentioned in the Old Testament of the Bible, so it's been done for a long time. If you go farther back, everybody did it uh, at once upon a time. Even though we don't have to uh, weave, we can go to the store and, and buy things. Still, it's um, sort of um, satisfying to be creative and say that you did this yourself. I'm Nancy Ellison, and welcome to Ellison Sheep Farm. variety of sheep here for my spinning and weaving. Currently there's 41 sheep. A lot of them are names. They're all like part of the family, like cats and dogs. And this is Buddy, and he's my little buddy. And each one is a unique character, and you notice little individual things about them. Yeah, a number of them have different personalities. I'm spinning some yarn today from a variety of sheep. I have drum carded the fiber with uh, gray, black, brown, and white wool of different colors. Well, each sheep is a little different, uh, and their wool is a little different in color and texture and so forth. I find I enjoy um, petting the sheep and feeling the wool and planning what I'm going to make out of it, and the whole process, starting from scratch, is kind of fun. Well, there's a number of different names for different types of weaves. Crook rod, it means crooked path, and it has little zigzags that go up and down typically. And this um, one piece I have hanging here, it has a typical crook rod design on the bottom, and then we, I tried doing different figures in it. This was one of the first things I ever wove, and it was in a class in, in Norway in 1968. 
It's, it's a traditional pattern. And this is a, uh, from a pattern from Norway. And the sweater was from a sheep named Elizabeth. And Elizabeth had some light wool and some dark wool. So uh, both colors came from the same sheep. And this triangular shawl, which I wove on one of my big old looms. You could weave all of your life and never but scratch the surface and the types of weaving you could do. So it's something you're never going to, to get bored with. And these are just some of the spinning wheels. I've got more in the attic and basement in another building. When I have counted, I've counted 50 or 60 spinning wheels at times. And this one, uh, these two had come from Sweden and along with a few of them up there. And there's a Norwegian one. Uh, most of the antique spinning wheels are probably from the later 1800s. And uh, these large old looms, this one came from Norway to um, this neighborhood actually. Uh, uh, probably the 1870s. Well, in the case of some of these looms, uh, they're rather large and take up space, and, and I've rescued some that probably would have been uh, used for firewood or destroyed. Well, once they're gone, they're, they're gone. And they might just look like a, you know, some boxy bunch of, of wood to the average person, but when you, you compare them and each one is handmade and they're each a little different little details that you notice. And now we have um, metal reeds which have been added to this. Some of the reeds, uh, like reeds from the swamp, uh, were uh, used. And they can be closer together, like this was a, a finer one. And of course this old one is um, somewhat broken, it wouldn't be usable, but it's um, part of the history of it. Well, through the years, I've taught a lot of community ed classes. Currently, I teach spinning once a month at a new little shop called Belated in Zimbroda. Nancy is very skilled at many different spinning techniques, and so she's very patient with the new spinners. And if it feels like it's not drawing, then uh, we can see if it's stuck someplace. Here. She can get you started from anything you want to do. You know, to, to first how to treadle, you know, basic techniques, where to hold your hands, um, how to, you know, feed the, the wall in. Um, it, is, it is pretty unique, but the fiber arts in southeastern Minnesota are thriving. It's relaxing, and plenty of people have someone in their family that has spun an aunt, um, a grandmother, a mother. Maybe they've inherited someone's spinning wheel from Europe, you know, to this country, but they've never tried it. They just have one sitting there. But then to actually sit down and make yarn, you know, like people had done since, well, since forever. It's kind of exciting. Well, I enjoy uh, raising animals and being out in the country. I grew up on a farm, and I was an only child without any brothers or sisters, so I uh, always enjoyed animals and, and feel blessed to have animals around here. And I like living out on the farm and uh, decide what I want to do at each moment. I don't have somebody telling me, well, you do this now, and I don't have to punch a time clock. I guess I feel like I'm sort of a, a chain in the link of, of weaving and teaching to people that, that they will continue on weaving. My granddaughter is now 13 and uh, she was uh, spinning 
when she was four or five years old, wanted to pedal the spinning wheel. And when she was eight years old, I bought her a spinning wheel for Christmas. But now she asked if she could borrow looms, so she, uh, she's uh, weaving a, a scarf that she's going to enter in the county fair next month. I'm very happy to have her continue on spinning and weaving. I think you're carrying on um, what's been done before and, and teaching people. And through the years I've uh, learned a lot of different things and when I teach classes and I feel like, especially as I'm getting old, that I'm sharing with other people that what I, what I do lives on that way. That's all. Now you can go out to the pasture for the day. Rochester has grown and changed since its founding in 1858. But despite some drastic changes, some things have stayed the same. We spoke with collector and amateur historian Alan Calavano, who has a passion for postcards and preserving history. Come along as we peek back in time with the help of some of Alan's beautiful vintage postcards. See how Rochester has both evolved and remained unchanged. Postcard collecting is a funny thing. Different people do it for different reasons. I like it because of the pictures that they show of things that don't exist anymore, or how things have changed. The official name for postcard collecting is Deltiology, which is, I think, just a fancy way of saying card collecting. I'm Alan Calavano. I'm kind of I say, an amateur historian. I wrote a book about Rochester based on my postcard collection. I also obviously collect postcards. For some reason, I just got attached to postcards because I like the fact that they show things the way they used to be. And the logical thing for me to collect, I thought, was Rochester because that was where I lived, and it kind of just grew from there. The first picture on the first chapter shows a street scene of Rochester looking south. You'll see that there's a the central fire station was right in the middle of Broadway. And the reason that was possible, in fact it was desirable, is that there was no bridge at that point crossing the Zumbro River. The other benefit of having it in the middle of the street is they actually pumped water out of the river because the fire station was originally designed to put out fires downtown. Later on, they uh, wanted to extend Broadway South to build a bridge, so they tore down the fire station and moved it to the west side of Broadway. The cool thing about Schuster is they had a beautiful postcard. It's one of the prettier postcards of Rochester. Back in the early 1900s, Rochester had a very active brewery called the Schuster Brewery. It was a very uh, productive, very profitable brewery. Uh, unfortunately, something came along called Prohibition. There isn't anything there now, but I'm sure it's gonna be an integral part of the University of Minnesota and Rochester as it grows south toward Soldier's Field. On page 105 of my book, there's a picture of the Bach Music Store, and the, the most interesting thing about that, uh, as I understand that Bach was later bought out by Schmidt Music, which still exists in Rochester, but Bach doesn't. In researching the postcard that I have of the Bach Music Company, the owner claims at least to be a descendant of Johann Sebastian Bach. Now, whether that's true or not would be hard to prove, but obviously he believed it. <laughs> which was probably the main thing. On page 107 in my book, there's a picture of the uh, Ear of Corn Water Tower, which is, uh, was originally at Libby's, 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 now at Seneca Foods. 
It's probably one of the two most recognizable landmarks in Rochester. The uh, Ear of Corn water tower is at the uh, Rochester Fairgrounds. And I think one of the coolest things is it's a biologically correct Ear of Corn. It's got the right number of kernels. It's got the right number of rows. It's been painted like 30 times since it was originally constructed in 1929, but it's clearly one of our two most recognizable landmarks. Postcards were kind of the tweets of their day. It was, it was the Facebook. And actually, even now, people buy postcards rather than taking a photograph because a professional photographer already took the picture. So, I mean, why bother taking your own? I mean, it's a, a memento. Back in the 1920s and early 30s, there was a fellow named Joe Fritch. And that was about the time that the Plummer Building opened. And Joe was the official greeter for any patient who came to the clinic. And he had a phenomenal ability to remember names. He made many, many friends, and at Christmas time, people would remember Joe and they would send him a Christmas card, but they didn't know Joe's last name, so they would send it to Joe Clinic. And for many years, that's how Joe got his postcards. I have since learned that Joe, in many cases, if it was snowy or sloppy, he would actually carry people from their car to the clinic so they wouldn't get their feet wet. And he did that for, I guess the whole time he was at the clinic, which I think was like 20 or 25 years. The thing I like most about the Rochester postcards, as I said, is that it helps you to see things the way they were. And of course, with any dynamically growing town like Rochester, there have been many changes. I just think it's cool to see how things have been, uh, try and better understand how they've changed. The value of history is that it's an anchor. If you don't know what happened before, the likelihood is it's gonna happen again. But at least you should learn what you can from the past. It always amazes me how quickly you forget the way things used to be. A program was recently initiated in the Cannon Falls School District that taught children about the culture of Afghanistan. Students learned about daily life from Afghan citizens, including the importance of mosaics in Afghan art. Influenced by what they learned, students created their own mosaics to in turn raise awareness about Afghanistan's vibrant culture. I think that art is a very good way to just express yourself. Well, we made the mosaics to tell other people what's going on in Afghanistan. And mine pretty much just says, even though there's so much chaos going on in Afghanistan, that's all the, these tiles. There's good things and there's bad things. You can always find hope. And then I spelled hope out in pebbles. Mine is about the landscape of Afghanistan because they have a really unique landscape. They have deserts and mountains in Afghanistan. And I made it because, like this mosaic, the people are equally unique. Uh, they're pretty much the same as us. They just don't have as many uh, advantages as we do. The flag is just that it's a sign of courage. Like when they fly it outside their homes, that's what they think like supposed to mean. They have a lot of courage. The project is actually called the U.S. Afghan Junior Investor Program. The program initially was to help our students learn to be global citizens and how they can help uh, someone else in the world. 
and so we wanted to really focus on the history and the rich culture of Afghanistan and, and teach these kids that um, it's not all negative and it's not all scary and it's not all confusing. The people are, are normal, but the life and situation around them is, is chaotic. So uh, we put together this program to really introduce our kids to Afghanistan and get them to understand and appreciate it. I worked with Dina Fessler through Children's Culture Connection. It's a nonprofit out of, based out of Denison, Minnesota. And we wanted to pick something relevant, something that's in the news that our kids could really relate to, and we chose Afghanistan. And we created a 10-part program that teaches all about Afghanistan, the culture, the um, history, the art, everything you can imagine, the food, the clothing, and the mosaics were created out of our art and recreation unit. Our country, the United States, has been intertwined for nearly a decade with Afghanistan, yet it's fascinating how little people know of Afghanistan. And a lot of people, um, and I'm at times, I'm sure I've been guilty of it myself, is like we have a tendency to think that's other people's problems to solve. And it's if it was something that was easy to solve, it would have been solved a long time ago. The Afghanistan project is to like get the message out to people saying that they can't just look at them for like what they look like and what they don't have. That you like can't take them for granted. You have to like be nice and treat them as you treat others. I think it's just a way for like kids here to connect with kids over there and to kind of pretty much get to know them better to understand what they're going through. In my opinion, I think it was mostly about learning about the outside world, like other than Canada Falls or the United States, like learning other perspectives because they're a third world country and we're like a first world country. And it's just like different, so we learned like the different perspectives. We really thought about what's an important piece of art in Afghanistan, and the mosaics are obviously an a ancient art form that comes from the country. So I went around and got a lot of different little shops to donate tile pieces for us. We got quite a variety, and the kids all created their own mosaic. We asked them to pick one piece of the program that really uh, meant something to them, or something they really learned from the 10-week program and create a mosaic around it. And this is what they came up with. Mosaic tiling is a, a, a you know, very popular art form in Afghanistan. And great buildings and mosques and, you know, the tiling on it is all very representative. It tells a story within what it is. And then, of course, the other reason for mosaics on a teaching level is that you can't just whip them together. But that's where the, that's where the passion comes from. I mean, if it was something that they could just, like, craft it together in, a, in an hour or two, they're not having the same experience. They had a, a tough time starting. You know, they didn't, they're, they're given all this tile and they're given a board and, and told, create something. Well, that's kind of tough for anybody. <laughs> so then we had them really focus on one part of the program that really inspired them. And that was pretty easy. They all found their, their topic pretty quickly. And then it just fell to place for them. You know, they'd take a few pieces of tile and they'd imagine what they wanted this to be and it just came together. It was really um, fun to watch them. Yeah. 
The overwhelming theme that I think is shown is hope. Children are resilient, you know, they, they can make it through a lot and they are optimistic by nature. So they usually found something that was powerful and, and hopeful in which to create their mosaic. They really like teaching, and, and that's when you know true learning has taken place, when you can turn around and teach what you've learned. And these kids can do that. You can sit down with them and have a conversation about Afghanistan, and they can teach you a lot. That's all for this episode. See you next time, Off 90. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.